did you did you get it? Okay. I'll begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again, Lord, for this day. I just thank you for these students. Just pray that you just help us to uh, wrap up the material for test one today. And again, I just thank you uh, for the perseverance of the students in the face of difficulty. In your prayer, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right. Um, so, you know, the other thing about the Fernet frame that I haven't advertised enough yet is, and I think this is perhaps the most interesting aspect of it, is the physics of motion. And so, one of the things we don't really talk enough about in, in the physics course here, or in math, is the concept of a moving coordinate system. Um, and so, one of the things you could use, the tangent, normal, and binormal to do, is you could imagine setting up a coordinate system, which is based on the Frenet frame, that moves along with you as you travel the curve. You could use the Frenet frame to set up a moving coordinate system. You could actually pick a point you know, in space P, and you could say, well, this point P is equal to you know, the base point of your curve plus, you know, say, x times t um, plus y times n naught plus z times v naught. And, and, and this would give you this, this x, y, and z would give you some kind of moving coordinate system. I, I don't want to get into the details, but you could, you could conceivably set up a moving coordinate system with the, um, with the Frenet frame if you wanted to. That's one interesting thing you could do. Uh, what I want to talk about here is a little bit less adventurous. It's just physics, motion. So start with, we talk about R of t is the position. What's the velocity? V of t is what, dr dt? Instantaneous velocity, of course, is a vector. How about the acceleration? That's dv dt, right? Which is, by the way, also um, d squared r dt squared. Now, there are other things you care about. Uh, let's see, what else do you like to talk about when you're studying uh, kinematics, right? Kinematics is just the study of motion. <clears throat> uh, you might want to talk about the displacement, right? The displacement is a vector. It's something like r of t2 minus r of t1, right? So displacement, and it goes hand in hand with average velocity, right? I don't think this is even in my notes, but if you wanted to talk about average velocity, you could take the displacement divided by the change in time. That would be the average velocity. As, as the delta t goes to 0, you get back to the notion of instantaneous velocity, of course, right? Now there's a, something else, though. We can also talk about, so that's the displacement. If you talk, also talk about distance traveled. The distance traveled. Right, if I went from, say, say, from time t1 to time t2 along this path of some material particle, what's the distance traveled? I guess it depends on what the person means. When I, when I, I have defined it in the notes to actually mean the literal arc length that the curve, it's, it's actually the length of a string if you were to lay it along this, this curve like that. That would be the distance traveled. So the distance traveled s would be the integral from t1 to t2 of what? Basically ds dt, right? Now that's just a slogan, but it's actually very accurate because, I mean, to integrate, to get s, you add up the ds's, right? But to integrate ds, you write it in terms of dt. But ds dt, we learned the other day, is just what? It's the length of the r dt, right? So that, of course, is just the arc length, the arc length integral we talked about. Arc length gives you distance traveled. The change in arc length with respect to time is speed. Speed is the magnitude of the velocity. All right, so now what I want to do is I want to connect the acceleration to the Frenet frame. So acceleration, let's see here, let's remind, remind you guys, t is equal to what? It's equal to basically v divided by v, right? And what's the definition of n? <laughs> t prime divided by, by, by t, actually. 
Well, let me you know, be a little bit more pedantic about it, T prime, uh, the, the length of T prime, right? And um, let's see, what else did we have? T prime was equal to what? It was equal to kappa times the speed times n. We learned that last time. That's the Fresnay equation in terms of a you know, non-unit speed curve. So the speed and the curvature co co comes into describing the time rate change of the, the unit tangent. OK, so um, let's see here. Yeah? Can you remind me what the difference is t equals uh, v vector over v? What, what those two are again? Uh, oh, v? Uh, right here. It's v is dr dt. V without a vector is the speed. Yeah, that's fine. If that, that convention we use. All right, so let's see here. I can write then, I can write, I can write the speed as what? The speed, excuse me, the speed, listen to me. I can write the velocity as what? The speed times the unit tangent, right? So what I'm trying to do right now, guys, is to discover with you the relation between the Frenet normal, the Frenet tangent, and the acceleration. We want to discover how to break the acceleration into its tangential and its normal components. All right. When we do that, all of a sudden, we're going to discover f formulas that you maybe have seen in high school physics just as a consequence of the frenet ray equations. So here we go. What, what would you do this? You got function of time, function of time, function of time. If I want a formula for the acceleration, I just differentiate that, right? Differentiate this, what do we get? dv dt, right? Of course, I mean, but that's what? That's ddt of vt, which is what? Product rule, am I right? So we have dv dt times t plus what? Plus v times dt dt, which is just t prime, of course, right? Too many t's? Sorry, it is what it is. I didn't make up this notation. I'm just using it. Um, so what is this? We have the acceleration is equal to the change in the speed with respect to time times the unit tangent plus what? dt dt, remember, is what? It's, see right here? So I can replace dt dt with kappa n, uh, you know, the curvature. I've got a v times v, I get a v squared, and um, n. Now this, this formula is very telling. What's this tell you about the acceleration? Is this a formula right here shows us the acceleration has no binormal component. The acceleration is a, is a, is a vector field we can write along the curve. Right? So if you were to think about each point on the curve, you can attach the acceleration vector. Right? That actually would show you the direction in which the net force is acting on the particle, according to Newton's second law. Apparently, it also has to lie in the direction of either t or n. So the acceleration cannot be in the direction of the binormal. It's an inescapable fact of calculus. See this formula? Where's the b? There's no b. b yeah, the, it's zero. <laughs> so these, this formula is so important that it gets its own discussion in physics. This is the so-called a sub t, the tangential acceleration which is aptly named, right? The tangential acceleration for the particle just tells you how fast the speed is changing, right? On the flip side, the normal component to the acceleration is kappa v squared, right? That's the so-called normal acceleration. So if you write this in terms of the radiature of 
radius of curvature, eh, words, this is v squared over r, right, if kappa is equal to 1 over r. That would be the radius of the osculating circle, so-called radius of curvature. Perhaps that's familiar. That's the centripetal acceleration formula. We usually put a minus on it because it's center seeking. But the Frenet normal points towards the, direct, the center of the circle. So the Frenet normal is already center seeking, which is why we have a positive sign there. And so if you have a curve, you know, if you pick any point, if the acceleration is like this, I can break it into two pieces. I can break it into the normal component of the acceleration and the tangential component of the acceleration. The tangential is in the direction of the tangent, right? So like this would be, um, you know, dv dt, t, that's the, the, the so-called a sub t, t, the, the tangential piece, right? And the normal piece points towards the direction of the center of curvature. Oh man, am I fresh out of... Uh, sorry, I have to go dumpster diving here. I'm not sure it's worth it. Aww. The good thing is you guys don't chew. Let's see here. I once went to a community college and the professor used to drink Pepsi and I was really confused by it because it's the weirdest thing. The, the bottle filled itself up as the class went on. <laughs> How does that work? Ah, uh, good times. I miss my community college. It was fun. Let's see here. So this, of course, is kappa v squared n, which we also know as a sub n n. That's the, the normal component to the acceleration. The acceleration can always be broken into these two pieces, the part which is attributed to the change in the speed and the part which is attributed to the rate of the changing of the direction of the velocity vector. <coughs> because the curvature, again, describes non-zero curvature says that the direction of the unit tangent is changing as you go along the curve. <clears throat> any, any questions? Yep. So in a 3D object, would that still be true? In a th this is 3D. This is 3D, okay. I was, I, was, I, I was thinking I was trying to visualize something. I have a hard time drawing 3D curves in the plane of the board, but you have to imagine. <laughs> It's well, I mean, the acceleration is the rate of change of the velocity. So, yes. Yeah, I mean, that's ultimately it. Is that the acceleration falls in the osculating plane? But I'm I'm really just kind of trading you one set of terms for another. I'm not sure that's really an explanation. To me, the explanation is this calculation we just did, which shows you, by calculus, the acceleration is a linear combination of the tangent and the normal, so it lies in the plane which is spanned by the normal and the, and the, and the tangent vectors, which is what we call the osculating plane. But you're right, I mean, that is the, the binormal serves as the, as the normal to this plane, and the acceleration has to lie in that plane as it happens. Let me show you some pictures. R? Yeah. R is the position vector. So we're talking about uh, you know, some kind of material bottle, body going through space as a function of time. 
R is the position of that material body at time t. So you, it's a you know it's a vector of the x y z components x y z coordinates of of a spaceship a car um, a bottle rocket. Oh, it can't be a bottle rocket anymore because this is America and we can't have people with bottle rockets. It made me so sad when I went to South Carolina and I found out bottle rockets had been made illegal in South Carolina of all places. Can you believe that? No bottle rockets. Does it depend what's powering the bottle rocket? Yeah, I do think the ultimate the ultimate irony is that you can get those super safety sparklers that I I mean I, I grew up in the People's Republic of New York, all right. So like I remember as a child, there was precious little, um, you know, actual fireworks. And then I moved south when I was a teenager, and all of a sudden, <laughs> whoa, awesome! But through the joy of YouTube, I've become acquainted with the fact that you can take those sparklers, like the, the ones that will burn you because they're safety sparklers with the metal, you know? And if you take those and you wind them together in a very specific way with electrical tape, as is easily found on YouTube. I'm supposed to say something about subscribing at some point, but I just keep forgetting. Yeah, I know. Sorry. But um, it's look it up, sparkler bombs. If you haven't seen them before, it's amazing. You just take like hundreds of these things and wind them really close, like wind them a certain particular way. They set off some kind of like explosion. I've seen people like they like take it a you know a, a washing machine or something and like blow it 30 feet in the air. It's awesome. It's like you know. But the the irony of it being done with safety sparklers is not lost on me. All right, we would like our VGA, please. Vidya. Mm. So here's an important problem. Yes, sir. It's a cap is one over R. Is that R radius? It's the radius of the osculating circle. Um, so, <clears throat> of course, in, in the case that the motion's around a circle, which I have in the notes here, kappa is actually literally 1 over r, where r is the radius of the circle the thing is going around. If you're going at constant speed, the, um, the tangential acceleration term drops out, and you just have the total acceleration is v squared over r, which we teach you in high school physics and stuff. Well, people who teach high school physics teach you. It's not something I would have taught you, because I don't teach high school physics. Or do I? I don't know. Depends on the semester, I suppose. But here is a very famous problem, the problem of constant acceleration downwards, like this. Whoa, they stayed together. That's nuts. So anyway, yes, constant acceleration downward, as you can see. Oh. Anyway, gravity makes the acceleration go downward, right? So if you pick a system of coordinates on the Earth and you don't go too far away, ignore the curvature of the Earth and all that junk, motion, um, you know, rotational motion of the Earth, blah, 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 to a good approximation, the acceleration due to gravity is just 0 minus g, if we just think about a two-dimensional plane of motion. So, all right, like the board. Um, so the acceleration is 0 minus g. If you integrate once, you get this. If you integrate twice, you get that. So this is the you know, standard kinematic constant acceleration problem. And what I've done here is I've just graphed for you in blue, here's the acceleration vector, right? And the green is the velocity vector, right? So the, the acceleration is, is, is taking away from the velocity. It's always making the velocity vector turn downward, right? See it? It's going up a little bit more down, it's flat, it turns down, like that. In each one of these cases, you could take the blue vector and you could decompose it into its tangential and, into its tangential and normal components if you wanted to. I haven't tried to do that in the picture, but that's also there. <coughs> um, so that, that's a good example. Here is uh, the... Um <coughs> Oh, could you, could, did you get it? It pans vertically now. You see that? It's a little stiff, but it'll do it. Um, so here I have r cosine omega t, r sine omega t. If you can recognize what that is, that's a circle, parameterization of a circle. 
Um, and so you work that out. The, the, the speed actually is r omega. Omega is what we call angular velocity in, in physics. That's the meaning of this. But the arc length then at time t is just r omega t. And um, curses. Well, this is just a starting example. I think I build on this later, and I show that the acceleration here is just, is just normal. There's no, because the, um, the, the speed is r omega, that means ds dt is what? If the speed is constant, what's ds dt? Zero, which means the acceleration can only be in the normal direction by the thing I just covered up with a white, with a board. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me get to it. Come on. So the point of this section of the notes, guys, is just to connect with high school physics and some formulas you've seen in physics. If you've, if you've had physics before, this should be like just kind of familiar. If it's not, then it may be new to you. Um, in which case, you'll get a better sense of what I expect from you from doing the homework. Okay. So anyway, so here's the circle, and then the the, te the you know the acceleration would break into two pieces, the tangential piece, which is tangent to the circle, and the center-seeking piece, the so-called centripetal piece, which is, by the way, also the normal piece, because center-seeking is the Frenet normal. Those, those are the same direction. And so you can always decompose acceleration like that. In the special case of constant speed motion around the circle, the total acceleration is just center-seeking. All right? And um, oh, for, for kicks. I, I, I was trying to do this example as an example of something you don't want to calculate. But, you know, so like here's gravity is a parabolic motion, right? So if I have, you know, the um, acceleration is uh, minus g y hat, and you calculate the motion, you get a, you get a parabola, right? And um, so I thought, OK, well, what's the distance traveled? I thought, I'm not going to be able to do this calculation. It'll be a good example of a problem that you can't actually calculate. But the funny thing is, when I worked it out, it was it was an integral I knew how to do, which was kind of annoying. Um, but I don't think that's an integral that I expect you to do in here. The arc, the distance traveled along this parabolic path <laughs> I've worked out here to be <laughs> 1 over twice times gravity, the initial x velocity squared, the hy inverse hyperbolic sine of the quotient of the initial y velocity, the velocity of the initial x velocity, plus the initial y velocity times the square root of the, well, that looks like the speed. Yeah, so there you go. That's the uh, distance. So if I do this, this formula would tell me exactly the distance that the marker went. <laughs> if I could actually quantify v naught x and v naught y as I threw it. <laughs> I think it's amazing what kinds of things we can actually quantify with calculus, by the way. All right. Um, let me put this away and actually show you an example. And then I'll take your questions, if you don't mind. One of your, one of your problems. I want to think about one of your problems with you before you even ask me about it. I asked you to find, I think, a sub n and a sub t for the motion of a particular, uh, for a particular uh, r of t. And I think I said verify. I'm, I want to remove that word from your homework, because that's an insidious command. Um, that's a good question, which number? Oh, did you guys see I posted the solution to mission one? Yeah, so. Um, I said, find a of t and a sub n components of the acceleration of the particle at time t. Verify that blah. I will remove, for the sake of common human decency, the phrase verify that a is equal to a sub t t plus a sub n n. In other words, it suffices for me that you can find a sub t and a sub n. I don't actually ask you to show me then that you can rebuild the acceleration from that, that linear combination of things. That's actually much harder. The verify part is much harder. OK. Yes, sir. Yeah, don't, you don't have to do the verify part. Now, here, here's, 
here is, let, let me explain to you why it's much nicer what I'm saying once I take away the verify. What's the connection between the acceleration and a sub t and a sub n? If there's anything you've learned from this discussion we've had about the Frenet normal, I hope it is that we can use dot products to select components if we have this orthonormal frame. Right? Like the, you know, dvdt is what? Another way, to, you know, I mean, in short, a sub t is what? a sub t is the acceleration dot the unit tangent, right? And what's a sub n? It's the acceleration dot n. Now it's also equal to this change in speed with respect to time and you know kappa v squared. Those are also true, but you know you've got different ways to attack a sub t and a sub n. And by the way, there's something else here. Geometrically, a looks like what? A is this. This is you know a sub t t, and here's a sub n. And what's the thing about this triangle? It's a right triangle. The tangent and the normal are orthogonal. That means that the length of the acceleration vector is related very simply to the normal and the tangent. So we get this equation also. a squared is equal to a sub t squared plus a sub n squared. This is very nice. This is very, very nice because it's easy to calculate the acceleration. You just differentiate twice. And it's relatively easy to calculate a sub t, because all you got to do is calculate the unit tangent and take the dot product with the acceleration. That's not too bad. The direct calculation of a sub n, though, that's unpleasant. But you see, we don't actually have to calculate n or curvature to get a sub n, because it's related to the acceleration through the Pythagorean identity. Right? You can get a sub n as the square root of a squared minus a sub t squared, because there's this right triangle trigonometry sitting there we use. Anyway, that's just a colossal hint about number 30 and an easy way to do it. I think I said I was going to do an example for you guys. Shall I do that? So let us suppose, here I'll pick something unpleasant. Hopefully it's not the one I already have in your, in your homework. Let's suppose we have the twisted cubic t, t squared, t cubed. Let's find the velocity, the acceleration, a formula for the distance traveled in terms of an integral. And if it's not too much trouble, let's find a sub t and a sub n. Okay. So what's what's the velocity? Two t, three t squared, right? What's the accelerate? Oh, so what's the speed? So you got 1 plus 4t squared plus 9t to the fourth. There's the speed. Velocity, speed. And then once I have speed, I can get the distance traveled from time 0 to time t, which is otherwise known as the arc length function, simply by integrating from 0 to t um, the square root of, say, 1 plus 4 tau squared plus 9 tau to the fourth d tau. So this is an integral formula for distance traveled. On the interval 0 to t, time interval 0 to t. If in a question I ask you in the homework in any of my courses, I mention find an integral formula, don't ignore those words. Don't ignore those words. Those words are a blessing. Those words are saying the integral is the answer. I'm saying you don't have to do the integral. Those are precious words. Embrace them. So this is an integral formula for the distance traveled. Now, that's not an integral I can do right off the top of my head. It might be solvable. I don't know. 
When can integral be done by elementary functions? When can't it? How do you know? You're like, you put it in Mathematica and see if it chokes? OK, that's a pretty good answer. It usually will work. There is actually an answer to that question. Apparently, it's birthed from something called inverse uh, differential Galois theory. But anyway, uh, A of t uh, is what? dv dt, which is what? Acceleration. Yeah, 0, 2, 60. Oh, that's relaxing after today. This is, I, I enjoyed that. Um, OK, what's the, what's the unit tangent? V over V, right? So what's the unit tangent? It's unpleasant, but it's just this, 1 over the square root of 1 plus 4t squared plus 9t to the fourth times the velocity 1, 2t, 3t squared. So what's the, what's the tangential component to the acceleration? I give you a vector. Let's call it Herbert. I give you another vector. Let's call it Jordan Schlansky. <coughs> How do you figure out the component of Herbert in the direction of Jordan Schlansky? You simply take Jordan Schlansky, you reset him to height 1, and then you take the dot product of that times Herbert. And that gives you the component of Herbert in the direction of Jordan Schlansky. It's very simple. Anyway, the point is dot products give you components, right? If this is uh, assuming that you're taking the dot product of a unit vector. Sorry, I've been watching Conan on YouTube lately, and there's this guy named Jordan Slansky. It's hilarious. But um, I don't have cable, so I'm, I, I pretty much just whatever YouTube feeds me. All right, so the a sub t then is a dot t, and that's equal to what? You can pull out that ugly square root factor. Actually, let me be lazier. Until I get to the final product, I'm just writing that as 1 over v, because that's what it is. And then acceleration is what? 0, 2, 6 t. Take the dot product with t, which was bit, 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 bit. Yeah, 1. I already pulled out the ugly factor to the front, right? And you can take dot products, right? 0 plus 4t plus 18t cubed. And there you have it. 4t plus 18t cubed divided by the square root of 1 plus, I didn't put this in your homework, did I? I'd be very annoyed if I'm working your homework problem right now. It's possible, though. I am a creature of habit. I hope not. There you go. That's the tangential, tangential component to the acceleration. How would I find the normal? Say again? Yeah, well, how would I get a sub n? Right, this, so they do the, well, I guess we have to allow for plus or minus. I, I, maybe I can't figure out, maybe I can't figure out the plus or minus without actually getting into the details of what I don't want to get into. But um, certainly it's plus or minus a squared, so a, 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 a benevolent Calculus 3 instructor who wanted to ask a question about this on a test in a friendly way would say something like, find the magnitude of the normal component to the acceleration, <laughs> thus freeing you from the plus minus obligation. <laughs> yeah, yes? So the answer that we got for A is B is also dv Indeed, that, oh, oh, that's true. That's true. You could have calculated that as dv dt. <laughs> is that obvious? Yeah. Yes, that's another way you could have done it. Good. Very good. That might be faster. Fair enough. But 
as you know, I'm trying to preach this gospel of taking dot products to get components of vectors. I hope you're noticing that. I don't, you know, okay. Focus. <laughs> What's A squared here? It's 4 plus 36 t squared. That's the length of A squared, right? Minus that thing. Oh, 4t plus 18t cubed divided by the square root of 1 plus, I'm not trying to be clever here, I'm just writing it down, okay? I'm not even doing any algebra, I'm just straight up copying it from the step above and squaring it. The point is that would be a sub n without simplifying. Again, the plus or minus I would have to think about to really choose. One of them has to be chosen. It's not both, it's one or the other. I would need some insight as to the direction which n is pointing in order to select a sign there. Hmm? Not without doing further calculations. Why don't I want to calculate n? What is n? Yeah, n is t prime divided by the length of t prime which is not fun because t is that. See? I'd have to differentiate this and then normalize it and that would give me n. And I don't really want to do that. Yep. I don't know. I haven't thought about it. The question was, is there a way to find the sign without doing all the calculations? Um, if you have something, if you have other knowledge about the curve, like for example, if you knew something like this is a picture of the curve, and and you know, oh, but I don't know what. How does? Oh man, how to? I guess if if the acceleration's out here, if the acceleration's like that, that would mean that the a sub n is less than zero. If the acceleration, uh, let me choose a less ambiguous point. If the acceleration here was like this, that would be a sub n is, is positive. But you know, I'm, I'm not sure right offhand what's the best way to determine the sign without actually doing calculations. Yeah. Yes, sir. With this particular curve, we know it's a upward helix, right? So is, don't we know that the sign is going to be negative? It's always going backwards the origin. Ah, uh, you might have something there. Oh yeah, yeah, he's got a good point. No, I, I, I think Luke is right. As we've talked about before, this is something like this, right? So, yeah, I, I think actually he's right. The normal is always... Oh, but the question is, that's what the normal looks like. I mean, that's just the normal. What's the acceleration look like here? How does the acceleration... How does the acceleration... How, but how does the acceleration relate to the curve at a particular point? Yeah. I don't know. I, I mean, T prime is got fine. <laughs> what you guys have done to me? All right. Uh, don't want to do this. Why have you done this to me? But I don't know how to answer the question you guys are answering without just doing this. But even after I do it, you know, once I'm done with this, what do I do with it? I, I, you know, that's a mess. yeah, it is a mess. And that's that's why, verif that's why taking off the words verify <laughs> is something you want me to do because you don't want to actually calculate n and and actually reassemble the thing, not without using Mathematica or something anyway. That's just t prime. I still got to find out its length and divide by it to calculate to, for, to to formulate n, and then I have to ask myself how does the direction of that compare to the direction of a at a given time, in order to choose the sign. I mean, there may be a simple way to choose the sign. I just I don't know. Right off the top of my head. Oh, okay. So, by the way, in this family of ideas, you notice if you calculate a sub n and you calculate a sub t, you can also calculate the curvature. 
right? How does the curvature relate? You can just remember this is equal to the curvature times the speed squared, right? So we just basically take the a sub n and divide by the speed squared, and there's the curvature. So I don't know. It's, I think this is a pretty, in some sense, this is a friendlier problem than when I ask you to calculate the whole Frenet frame from a given curve, right? It's kind of the same ball of wax, though. I mean, it's, I didn't take a cross product anywhere, though. And for that reason, my head doesn't hurt as much. All right. So I, I had got cookies for you guys, but then I, I kind of gave them to uh, business calculus. So I'm just going to eat it for you instead. I'll bring you something tomorrow. This is for your learning. Would you like to trade your five bonus points for a cookie? No, we'll keep them? OK. All right. Anyway, so I, I just wanted to encourage you guys, as you read the notes here, don't be scared. If you, if you haven't had high school physics, or if you haven't studied physics 231 here, and the things I'm saying about physics and kinematics are unfamiliar to you, that, that's OK. I'm, I, I'm not going to, I will not test you on your physical whether you're with it in terms of physics problem solving here. That's not what this course is about. I'm just trying to show you the tools which we, and I'm, I'm showcasing how the tools can be used for physics, but that's just for breadth. That's not something I actually would test on typically, All right? Because I, I know if you haven't had physics, probably if, if you read my section on kinematics, it may be uncomfortable for you because I'm, I'm trying to share a common experience with you that you haven't had, All right? Well. Surely you guys have questions about something easier. Oh. I thought I heard something. Oh, it was a hiccup. Okay, okay, okay. I will allow it. Dear. <laughs> Actually, that's the worst, is like I have a sneeze and then like I kind of like catch it mid sneeze and then it like explodes somewhere like here. It just feels awful, right? Like it's the worst. Oh. Now, I actually do have notes written about moving coordinate systems. If you look at my Math 430 notes, I have like a whole chapter on how you can do coordinate systems that are moving, which is interesting to physics and engineering, but it's just something we don't cover. It's not in calculus books, and it would be frightening if I did. So, but useful, but frightening, but, but useful. Mostly frightening, though. So, you guys must surely have a question then. Yep. Oh. It's mathematical models and physics from uh, NC State. This is their first upper level course I taught to some unknowing victims. They survived, though. We don't, we don't have it here. I just I have notes from it when I taught it. But yes? Um, can you give me an like, mm -hmm. I don't know, direction for column 17? Um, well, the key to these parameterization problems is, you know, like I said before, you got to know about the sine and cosine and caution. Oh, caution cinch. You, you're, okay. <laughs> I told you I was going to tell you about caution cinch, and then I proceeded not to. Um, <clears throat> so, well. So first of all, uh, you know, part A, is there a particular one here you're most, all, all of them? <laughs> OK. Um, in the plane, which plane? Oh, the xy plane. 
So when I say in the plane like that, I must mean in the xy plane. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. Um, so here's one. How about what if, we, what if I had um, well, all kinds of fun noises today? Let's see here. Let's see here. What if I had? I don't know, x plus 2 quantity squared eh, minus, um, here I'll make it different, 3 times y minus 1 quantity squared equals to 1. I want to parameterize this. It's, it's, it's basically some kind of like, it's like a hyperbola. I mean, it is a hyperbola. It's just not a standard one because of that 3. But what I think of when I see something like this um, is just, OK, so I know cosh and cinch, right? I know cosh squared minus cinch squared is 1. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically force this thing to be cosh squared. Uh, I need a letter, let's say, t. And I'm going to force this whole thing to be cinch squared t. And if I do that, that will at least give me a parameterization of half of this thing. So OK, so that, that from that, I, 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 I glean that x plus 2 I should make equal to cosh t. And um, let's see here, the square root of 3 times y minus 1 I should make equal to the cinch of t. Because then if I square it, the square root, the square root of three becomes. Oh, that's not. Yeah, that's fine. So if I square, obviously if I square both sides, I get cinch squared and get this term right. And if I square both sides this is here, I get cosh squared and I get that term. So if I force these equalities, when I plug whatever equations I get from these back up in there, it works. Now I just have to solve for x and y, and those are my parameterizations. So. Uh, x equals 2 uh, minus 2 plus hyperbolic cosine of t. And y is equal to um, 1 over the square root of 3 hyperbolic sine of t um, plus 1. And those are the parametric um, scalar equations which we parameterize that curve. This is, of course, for x, x greater than, this, this force is x greater than uh, minus, greater than or equal to minus 2, well, even not even minus 2, x greater than or equal to what? Minus 1, actually. Because hyperbolic cosine, at its smallest, is 1. And then it's just bigger. My brought cosine is like goal. But the goal is posted at 1, and it just goes up. So if you think about it, this formula for x is at its, you know, it's always larger than minus 1. So that would just, that, you know, so see here, graphically speaking, what's going on? Hyperbola is x equals minus 2. So what I've just found are the formulas something, and, and uh, y is equal to 1, right? So <laughs> Fun. Um, so here's x equals to minus 2, y equals to 1, if I haven't done this wrong. Um, Oh, here, let me fix that. There, fixed. So yeah, this, this, this is at smallest right here, and then it kind of just balloons out like that. Now, the, the hyperbola has two branches. I've only parameterized the right branch with those formulas. To parameterize the other branch, what would I do? Uh, make it right, make it a negative. Yeah, 
to get to get this one over here, I would just use x equals to minus 2 minus hyperbolic cos uh, cosine of t. And I can just keep y the same if I want. Now, of course, both of these are parameterized so that they're upward flowing, that they flow from up to, you know, they, they're flowing upward. As time goes on, they're, that's the uh, orientation the, the, of these curves because the dy dt is, is, is equal to 1 over square root of 3 cosh t, which is positive. So the, both of the curves are flowing upwards. Okay, let's do the next part, b. I'll try to go faster. What was b? I think actually b probably you can figure out if you look at the notes. That one's just a circle of radius center, radius 7. So here I'll do circle, uh, radius 10 um, at, let's say, 42, 41, 40 in, um, I don't know, x equals to through, I, bet, I guess I better do x to equal 42 plane, otherwise it doesn't make sense. <laughs> so um, there's this x equals 42 plane, right? Some, there's this point in the plane, 42, 41, 40. And then, of course, you know, back here you've got your whatever, your x and y. And the, the, the picture doesn't really matter. And, um, but we're trying to parameterize this circle, radius 10. <laughs> and so um, the answer is R of t. I guess, fine, you want me, is, it, is, is, is this friendlier? OK, I'll do that then. x equals 2, well, that's easy. I can do that one, 42. <laughs> and then y is equal to, well, 41. z is equal to, well, 40. Um, but then it's what you do with the y and z that's interesting. So you do plus 10 cosine t, plus 10 sine t. And so what, what that does is it, it either adds or subtracts 10 from the y as t varies, and this adds or subtracts 10 from the z as z varies, and it traces out this circle in this, you know, in the y and z varying. And, and you, can, you can check that. Um, if you look at the distance between the pair, the, the, the point this comma this comma this, from the center point 42, 41, 40, it always has length 10. It's a circle. So, but, but that's it. Just take your center point and add the radius times cosine, radius times sine. Now, this, these formulas will give this thing a, um, let's see here, I, I, think, I think the orientation will be like, like this direction is my, in my current formulas. So later it will become important to know how to make it go one direction versus the other relative to a, a choice of, of. How about the other part? <laughs> part C, I'm not so sure. I know how to do right off the top of my head. <laughs> C, what was, what was C? A circle of radius 7 and the x plus y plus z equals 12 plane. So let's see here, what if I had, instead, let me just change the problem a little bit. What if I had x plus 2y plus 3z equals to one plane? And I need to pick some point, some point on the plane to put a circle. What's a point on this plane? Um, zero, zero, one third. Zero, zero, one third. <laughs> one, zero, zero is the correct answer to my question. <laughs> Um, I hope you realize I'm joking. That's a point anyway. And we could ask, what's the, what's the circle of, say, radius 2 in the plane? How would you find, you know, the parametric equations for such a circle? I don't know. I, I'm not sure what I would do with those, though. Into the 
Yeah, but that doesn't give you a circle. That gives you an ellipse. If I feed, uh, if I feed an ellipse into the param parametrization of the like, you know, if I had a param parametric thing of the plane, I think it, w it will change a circle to an ellipse. Generally speaking. Yeah, I think we could do something like, I mean, I think the question is, what do you want? If I take a point on the circle and I call that point x, y, z, what do I want for that point x, y, z? Let's just, I mean, what does it mean for it to be on a circle in the plane? Yeah, equal distance. This, this distance is 2, right? What, what is that distance, though? It's x minus 1 squared, right? Plus y squared plus z squared. Thanks to you guys picking that awesome formula, which just has zeros on the y and z. Woo so that's a condition, right? I mean, I, I kind of like to rewrite this as 4 is equal to the stuff without the square root. That makes me happier. So one way of envisioning this circle we're looking for is it's really just the intersection of the plane and the sphere of radius 2 centered at 1, 0, 0. Right? If you, if you take a sphere and you take a plane through its center, what's the intersection of the sphere and the plane? It's a circle. It's a great circle, right? So, so what? Well, this may actually be the time that I will use the, uh, I think I'm going to go with a Cartesian parameterization. I, I don't know, maybe I can find a better way. As I said, I feel like it's always kind of a, what I'm about to do, I feel kind of, I, I will admit it makes me feel kind of dirty. It's uh, not my favorite, but it's a way. So I have two equations and three unknowns, right? Because this is also true for that point, right? We have both of these, these things. So to say that the point on the curve is to say both of these equations hold. These are kind of analogous to the symmetric equations of a line. These are the sort of quote unquote symmetric equations for this curve. But we want parametric equations, right? So what do you, what do you guys want to do? There's all kinds of things you could do here. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say x minus 1 is equal to cosine t. And I'm going to say that y is equal to sine t. <coughs> and see if I can get away with that. I may not be able to. No, nope, I can't get away with it. I wanted to get away with it, but that won't work. Because if I do that, this gives me cosine squared plus sine squared, which is 1. And then I get 3. I get 3 is equal to z squared. z is equal to plus or minus the square root of 3. Well, if z is equal to plus or minus the square root of 3, there's no hope. I have no hope of compensating that with this x plus 2y plus 3z. You see, if x is equal to cosine t plus 1 and y is equal to sine t, when I add those two things together, I can't make this 3z go back to 1 if z is plus or minus the square root of 3. This won't work. But I tried. didn't work. I mean, you can pick you can pick one of the Cartesian coordinates as your parameter and see if that works. Which one would you like to pick? I think it doesn't matter. Let's use x. So x is equal to t. So we know the formula for x. And then what's y equal to? One minus x, right? Well, I mean, the point here then is if you make that choice, right, then what we want to do is to see if we can find some way to eliminate this 